All right, this is Rockford Reading Rockford Reading Daily, episode eight, day eight. We are reading "Have Black Lives Ever Mattered" by Mamia Abu Jamal. Let's start on page eighty. While rage bubbles in black hearts, August twentieth, two thousand eleven. It has taken a while to reach this conclusion, but upon reflection, it is inescapable. Why, after over half a century of black voting and the election of more black political leaders than at any time since Reconstruction, are the lives, fortunes, prospects, and hopes of black people so grim? Our education system is in shambles, with the dropout rate nearing 50% in most central cities. Black communities are either ignored or gentrified into oblivion. Joblessness stalks families by the highest percentage since such figures were first recorded and black families face foreclosure and its, and its concomitant result, homelessness, at rates far exceeding those for any other demographic. A direct result of the mortgage scams that line the pockets of Wall Street, banking executives and their minions. In cities boasting black mayors and black police chiefs, police violence against citizens continues unabated and the prison industrial complex traps generations in chains. One is forced to conclude that black America suffers maladies similar to those faced by continental African nations, a segregated neo-colonial system in which a political class gives the appearance of freedom and independence while perpetuating racial oppression and financial exploitation. Sadly, electing more black politicians does not equal more black political power. For, in this surfeit of black representation, voices of discontent are muted, while rage bubbles in black hearts and minds. And rather than black politicians speaking for those who voted for them, they too are muted, more loyal to party than people, more anxious to not rock the boat, even when water rushes through the breached hull. They speak to them, preaching patience, while home burns. And they mimic white politicians, echoing their words, while, quote, representing, end quote, communities that cannot be more desperate. If black politicians are to do the very same thing as their white colleagues, why have them at all? What's the difference? Neo-colonialism at home and abroad. Uh, The first thing that I think about after reading that passage is that Charles Box was the first black mayor of Rockford, Illinois. I can't remember the exact years of his term. It was, I believe, the late 80s, early 90s. But Charles Box would advocate for more police in the in the city uh, advocate for more police in the community Charles Box would a black mayor Charles Box would under the police that police act the police bill that the crime bill that Bill Clinton enacted would uh, help to weaponize further weaponize would still will help to further weaponize police terror against uh, communities of color and against communities of of low cl- lower income and working class. Also think about how we currently have a black police chief, a black woman police chief, uh, and how that that act of putting a black face or a black head at the top of a white power structure ha- is has been used and is currently being used even here in Rockford, Illinois to distract people from the issues and to distract people from tracing back the roots of these issues and to try to cover up uh, racism and to try to cover up prejudice and biasness. And I think that one of the things we have to begin to do is uh, to inform our community and to educate ourselves to be able to uh, understand and be able to uh, realize and notice when these type of smoke and mirror political actions are taking place and when figureheads are put being put into place. And again, if we have black faces in these white spaces that are only echoing the sentiments of of white community or of white political leaders, then that is not getting us closer to a, a equitable society. That is not getting us closer to absolving ourselves of things that disproportionately affect people of color. <clears throat> okay. Troy Davis, Movement Lessons, September 9th, 
2011. The state murder of Troy Davis of Georgia of Georgia demonstrates both the limits and the successes of the anti-death penalty movement. <clears throat> it may seem inappropriate to speak of successes when an innocent man is poisoned to death by judicial decree, but though they were partial, they were successes nonetheless. Organizing the support of people like former U.S. President Jimmy Carter, Pope Benedict XVI, Bishop Desmond Tutu, and former FBI Director William Sessions was no small feat. It shows the power and diversity of solidarity with a movement that reaches across lines of color, faith, nationality, and political station. The movement's success was also fueled by revelations of people like Antoine Williams, who was one of the state's trial witnesses. Williams later stated, quote, After the officers talked to me, they gave me a statement and told me to sign it. I signed it. I did not read it because I cannot read. I felt pressure to point at him, end quote. <clears throat> Was there police coercion in the Davis case? The district attorney certainly thought so, as shown by his remark, quote, oh, well, they were probably coerced by the defense too, so that balances it out, and we should still kill them, end quote. <clears throat> Man, sorry about that, y'all. But... Oh, well, they were probably coerced by the defense, too, so that balances out, and we should still kill them, end quote. Think about that. What power of coercion does the defense possess? Handcuffs? Threats? Criminal charges? Jail cells? Death sentences? <clears throat> that any prosecutor can say something so dopey and maintain influence is, well, nuts. The movement organized a solidarity with Troy Davis amassed, remarkably, close to a million signature on petitions. But signatures on paper or online do not send quite the same message as do people in the streets. If, perhaps, a million people have marched, Troy Davis might still be alive today. It is bitterly ironic that William Jefferson Clinton, America's so-called first black president, got laws on the books to prevent serious judicial review and remedy. He did this, of course, by supporting and signing into law the notorious Anti-Terrorist and Effective Death Penalty Act, a law that forced federal judges to defer to state courts on criminal law and limit death row appeals. Troy Davis's family and supporters have brought much to the anti-death penalty movement. I hope their indignation with the system further advances their mission, purpose, and struggle. In so doing, they ensure that Troy Davis will never be forgotten. And so that brings us to uh, another incident of, of, of another branch of mass incarceration, which is uh, the death penalty. And again, one of the things that, that we, we have to understand is when we use mass incarceration and imprisonment as a way to try to absolve uh, these root issues as opposed to actually addressing these root issues, uh, you end up with people getting not only caught up in these systems and falling victim to these systems, but you have uh, <clears throat> uh, you have uh, biases that are all through all layers of these systems and that are uh, 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 laid out. Uh, all right, I'm gonna move on to the. I'm gonna, let's keep on moving on to the next uh, passage. What do you call a judge who makes racist statements? March 4th, 2012. A United States federal judge, one of the most respected and powerful actors in the nation's entire judicial system, sends a joke to a close circle of friends. So far, so good. But the joke is a racist insult against both the sitting president of the United States and his mother. <clears throat> the word gets out and the judge promptly apologizes and insists he isn't a racist. Of course he isn't. <clears throat> a judge, someone sworn to protect the legal, civil, and constitutional rights of all U.S. citizens, privately distributes racist jokes about the President of the United States, but he's not a racist. Indeed, if the media are any measure, the only people portrayed as racist these days are black people, like Minister Louis Farrakhan 
or the late Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad. A few years ago, I saw a man standing in a Ku Klux Klan robe announce on a nationally televised talk show that he wasn't a racist. When no one is racist, then racism becomes invisible. It becomes the province of, quote, hypersensitive and, end quote, blacks who are called racist when they point out racism. And, meanwhile, beyond symbolism, lies a reality as bitter and as repressive as ever before for millions. Question. What do you call a judge who makes racist statements? Answer. Quote, your honor. End quote. The Trayvon Martin case, April 12, 2012. News of the Trayvon Martin case has rushed around the globe at cyber speed, due in large part to social media. It had all the markings of a national tragedy and, of course, is an ongoing one, despite recent charges. But what seems most overlooked in all the news and reporting is an understanding of what has historically come before. Florida has a long and nasty history of events such as these, but often the antagonist is a cop, not a civilian playing cop, as is the case here. <clears throat> in May 1980, Miami's Liberty City erupted into an orgy of flame, rage, and righteous indignation stemming from the police beating of 33-year-old Arthur McDuffie, a black insurance executive. McDuffie wasn't just beaten, he was beaten to death by four police officers. An all-white jury later acquitted all four of all charges. My memory of McDuffie could have been su- excuse me. My memory of McDuffie could have been substituted by a slew of other names, most long forgotten by all but family or friends, casualties of a long and dirty war waged by white supremacists. People like 21-year-old Randy Heath, killed in Hialeah, Florida, by a cop who was later acquitted. And Timothy Dwayne Thomas, anybody remember his name? Anybody? 19 years old and slain while moving through his own neighborhood of Over the Rhine in Cincinnati, Ohio. His killer, a white cop who, though later indicted, walked free after being acquitted. Indeed, when the Philadelphia Police Department dropped a bomb on a residential neighborhood home, killing 11 black children, women, and men, and incinerating two blocks that destroyed the homes of 250 people, there were no acquittals, for there were no charges. No charges in a massacre. Yes, there were distinctions, but they are distinctions without a difference. For all these cases speak to the cheapness of black life in the eyes of a U.S. justice system that permits white cops to beat, shoot, bomb, maim, and kill with impunity. In the Trayvon Martin case, we have a guy playing cop and a dead 17-year-old black boy. Close enough. I think that uh, my thoughts, my thoughts, I want to go back to what do you call a judge who makes racist statements, that passage. We've had, uh, as an organization, because we we have... uh, a member who goes to, well, multiple members who go to court dates of people who have been arrested during protests, the people who have been victims of police terrorism and of, of, of other cases surrounding of things that have gone on in the uh, Winnebago County. And so we have learned a lot about the judicial system that exists here. And there is, uh, I don't think that I don't think that any of these issues that have been highlighted in the judicial system and some of these other places, they're all issues that are also relevant here. Uh, Excuse my, I I sort of butchered that sentence. uh, But these are all things that happen here. There are judges here who, while on the stand and on the bench, clearly are uh, using their biases when determining cases, are using their our prejudices when determining cases and what happens to which person and uh, the same thing as far as the prosecution and again this whole system is set up in an inhumane way in which in which as long as it is set up in this manner until we we truthfully 
uh, acknowledge the racism that is inherent in these institutions and and uproot the, these things and form a new new institutions and new ways to deal with these with these causes and, and stop just dealing with these effects until we until that happens we will continue to see racism in the judicial system we continue to see racism in uh, police departments you will continue to see uh, racism in in, in in government and then when you when we as we get to the murder of Trayvon Martin I think about uh, around this time my uh, I was having a, a son, and I had had a child, and I, my mind had went from when I hear hearing about these cases of police violence, and went from imagining myself being the victim and imagining this being something that happened to me, and beginning to wonder about this happening to this child that I had just helped to bring into the world. Imagine this happening, this young black. Uh, baby that will one day become a young black man and all of these same things that I have uh, walked around with having a specter over me becoming a specter over him and so that, those are some of the first thoughts that I have from going back and reading these things and then I think that the totality of all and I said this on the last passage as well but the totality of all of these events that are taking place the the similarities and the differences in all of these events that are taking place around police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice that are being spoken about in here. These macro aggressions that are happening all over the nation. Uh, these are the things that I believe we have to sort of use as rallying cries and, and use as, as uh, ways to draw people in to become more informed about the issues and become more informed about the, about the microaggressions and to begun, begin to understand the the reasons that the microaggressions are, are so dangerous because they build up and lead to the macroaggressions that we're reading about here and, and have Black Lives Ever Matter. And I think another thing that's happening is as we continue to read through these passages, the, the answer is being presented to you when the question from that is being asked by Mami Abu-Jamal, the question of have Black Lives Ever Mattered? Uh, and on page 88, the answer continues to be no. For Rodney King, the struggle is finally over. June 17, 2012. Mention the name Rodney King and people react. They might react in different ways, but they react. For almost no one is neutral. His name is evocative because it ties you to one of the biggest urban rebellions in U.S. history. The 1992 Los Angeles riots followed the acquittal of a flanks of cops who beat King brutally, an act that was documented on videotape. When a predominantly white jury in Simi Valley acquitted the cops, L.A. streets exploded in rage. Not since the 1960s have we seen riots so intense or so destructive. The riots made Rodney King famous or infamous, depending on one's perspective. The image of Mr. King, his face battered, asking plaintively, quote, can we all get along, end quote, has entered the realm of history and with it a question we have yet to answer truthfully. Rodney King, age 47, was found dead early Sunday morning at the bottom of his pool, apparently drowned. For Rodney King, finally, the struggle is over. And then let me see where we're at on time. Uh, are we only on 18 minutes and 46 seconds? Let's keep on going. Trayvon and the War Against Us, June 19, 2012. For a brief moment in time, the name and fate of Trayvon Martin broke through the daily media fog and touched the lives of tens of thousands of people, motivating them, mobilizing them, and moving them to take direct action against the gross inaction of the state. Mobilizing them, sorry, I fumbled that word. Youth across Florida walked out of high schools and took to the streets, People in dozens of cities marched, seemingly spontaneously, against a racial caste system that seems to consider people of color to be guilty until proven innocent. Many of these young Americans took their anger to the streets because they sensed an unsaid truth. It could have been them. It could have been them. And these protests take place amidst the greatest institutional violence against blacks since the height of the civil rights movement. By that, I mean the silent assault of mass incarceration 
or what law professor Michelle Alexander terms, quote, the new Jim Crow, end quote. And it matters not that Trayvon's killer wasn't a cop, as is usually the case. He was an informal auxiliary to a system that, po that polices black life and holds our every act under suspicion. The South, for centuries, was an armed white army in which every white male was empowered by law and custom to control black life by any means necessary. Trayvon was judged guilty of walking while black and breathing while black, as are many, many black and Latino youth every day. No matter what the result of the Trayvon Martin case, I happen to think that the acquittal was down the line, the new Jim Crow pecks at black, brown, and poor lives daily, destroying any future they may have once dreamed of having. What we learn from Trayvon's case is that organizing makes a difference, protest has impact. For without the pressure of protest, there would be no counterforce against bigotry in American society. That lesson must translate to a call for resistance against the vast social injustice of the prison industrial complex. When more black men are in chains today than at the dawn of the Civil War, when enslaving people was legal, or when the South African system of apartheid was in full swing, mass protests are a necessity. And so, as we continue uh, reading through Have Black Lives Ever Mattered by Mami Abu-Jamal, uh, we, we read a, a passage about Rodney King, and uh, I was not old enough to have a, a strong memory or have any memory of the L.A. riots when they took place. But as early on as I can think back, whenever I thought of, whenever I heard the word riots or thought of riots or thought of uprisings and these things, uh, the L.A. riots were the first things that came into my mind. The L.A. uprising. Uh, I know that different people like to use different terminologies, and I do think uprising is a better term to use. But those were the first images of things that came to my mind. Uh, and when Ferguson took place, when then years later, uh, in last year, uh, the murder of George Floyd and the uprisings that took place all over the country, all over the world around the murder of George Floyd took place. The first thing that I would recall back to was the L.A. riots and being uh, younger and growing up and, and watching and reading and hearing about the L.A. riots. And so that's some of the first things that I think of when I read when we read through that passage. And then uh, as we continue to read through more and more passages uh, speaking about Trayvon Martin and the murder of Trayvon Martin, it just continues to make me uh, to remember the emotions and the feelings that I had around Trayvon Martin and his murder. And I remember knowing before, you know, we haven't and we haven't got to the point of talking about uh, George Zimmerman being found not guilty. But I remember knowing that he was going to be found not guilty understanding that he was going to be found not guilty of this but for some reason I had and not for some reason but I, I was still young enough to have a, a we outside we outside they out, they out on the dirt bikes we outside y'all but I remember being young enough to be naive enough to to just be so hopeful that uh, this man would not be acquitted for this thing, for these actions. And, and then in here, in this passage, Mamiya, Mamiya Abu-Jamal also began to speak about the new Jim Crow, to speak about mass incarceration, the prison industrial complex. And one of the things that I have uh, learned in my journey throughout this struggle is that you cannot, once you begin to advocate against the macroaggressions of police terrorism, which are these 21st century lynchings, which are these police killings in the street or these white vigilante killings in the streets, you begin to have to try to find out where they originate from and why they happen so often and how often they happen in the places that you are at. And that complete, and that ties you into learning more about the institution of policing. And as you learn more about the institution of policing, it naturally ties you to learning about the prison industrial complex and learning about mass incarceration and understanding the type of demand and for prisoners that this country has built up and the uh, private, the things that go into private prison and the, and all, you know, all of these different layers that, uh, that come with mass incarceration. And so uh, I believe that that is one of the things that, ha that, that comes naturally as you begin to try to fight against the macroaggressions. And I think that the macroaggressions are the things that draw people in or are the things that 
force people to, uh, or not force people, but stir people up enough uh, to want to find what they can do. And then once they begin to uh, try to find what they can do, it becomes incumbent upon organizers and uh, activists and community, uh, I don't want to say leaders, but uh, van the vanguard in the community to shift people's attention to also mass incarceration, to also to the racial injustices. Uh, let's see where we at on time. 25, 26. We're not going to have one more passage. Tears of Sorrow and Rage, November 2nd, 2012. For decades, the Oakland Police Department has been the focus of fear. Fear because the agency, which years ago recruited heavily from the South, had people on staff that used their office to exercise their hatred of blacks through social repression and violence. For a brief time, the Black Panther Party put a crimp in their strut as it became a local and then national force of resistance to police departments' repeated assaults on blacks. But the Black Panther Party is no more, and the repression has come surging back. Adam and Geraldine Bluford knows this dark reality all too well, for on May 6, 2012, their 18-year-old son, Allen was shot and killed by the Oakland Police Department's Miguel Massa. Allen was one of countless youngsters forced to submit to the department's outrageous stop and frisk tactics. Allen, rightly, was afraid of such contact and following his instincts, took flight. Miguel Masso chased him and killed him. Now Allen's parents are demanding answers, but all they're getting are responses and lies. Excuse me. Now, Alan's parents are demanding answers, but all they're getting in response are lies. The story of what happened has changed at least a half a dozen times, and Oakland's political officials have promised much and delivered nothing. For, forced to support either those who voted for them or the Oakland Police Department, Oakland's politicians invariably opt for the latter. Thus, from the people that are sworn to represent them, the people get evasion, or worse, silence. For the Oakland Police Department has money and power. And when, ha and when have you seen any politicians turn their back on either? As for the member of the family of the teenager whom they will never hug again, that continue to organize resistance to the menace of state violence, impunity, and repression. This was, this was the first time that I've heard first time that I've heard about Alan Buford Alan, Alan Bluford excuse me and again we get to a place of and it's just you know makes me think of Tyrus Jones who was chased and shot Jose Gonzalez Jr. who was chased and shot little Mike Seiko Jr. who was crawling away and shot and how often Mark Barmore was shot in the back. How often people are shot in the back or shot while fleeing, and uh, and again, all the the families, you know, the families that are left traumatized from these things, the families that are that are left to pick up the pieces after their loved ones have been murdered, after their loved ones have been killed, and they have to deal with their loved ones being criminalized on the news and stigmatized on the news, and uh, and. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that sticks out with me to that. Let's read, let's read one more. The Dorner Dilemma. February 18th, 2013. The short but utterly fascinating police career of Christopher Jordan Dorner has captured the attention of millions. Dorner, a fired Los Angeles cop, vowed war against his former colleagues and almost made good on his threats. Citing the police department's institutional racism in an unfair disciplinary proceeding that resulted in his termination of employment, the ex-cop pledged the exact revenge and unleashed a deadly rain of bullets on several of his fellow officers. Trained as a sniper in the agency's elite squads, Dorner sent shockwaves of terror through the highest ranks of the agency by targeting the families of officers. For 10 days, he struck and moved, leaving the urban landscape for mountainous territory nearby. After a series of shootings, he escaped to an abandoned cabin where more than 100 cops eventually converged to permanently, quote, retire, end quote, the former cop. Using pyrotechnic tear gas, 
They launched a grenade into the cabin, covered the doors, and waited for the raging fire to do its work. The blaze raged for hours, the last weapon deployed in Christopher Dorner's war. Many are left pondering the forces that triggered Dorner. Fired after a questionable internal hearing, this black cop turned on the very forces that had this black cop turned on the very forces that had trained and nurtured him. He was called a quote monster, end quote, and worse by reporters, pundits, and police. If true, he was a monster of the LAPD's making. What did he see? What did he experience that turned his heart to ice? We may never know. But we await the next Dorner, angry, embittered, soured on the job, and determined to deliver his own, quote, burn notice, end quote. Okay, and then we'll end this ride for reading daily on that note. Uh, if you please go and listen to previous episodes, if this is your first time tuning in, uh, if there's more episodes out, by the time you hear this, go listen to the newer episodes. Share this on whatever platform that you're listening to it on. And again, we put out these Rafa Reading Dailies to give everybody an opportunity to begin to uh, take part in the, the struggle against police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice every day. And to also offer the opportunity for people to, to uh, further progress on the journey to struggle against police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice every day. All right. We outside. I'm going to end it.